God speaking to me. You make a coffin and you live in it six foot underground and you broadcast live stream from the coffin. So I made a coffin eight foot long that um, it was about, um, it was a meter high and a meter wide. And I buried it in a place called Halifax in Yorkshire in England, six foot underground. And I went down, it had a mattress, had electricity and I had fiber optic broadband in my coffin. So, <laughs> so it had two tubes going to the surface for airflow and so they could pass food down. Um, and I, I saw, I was down in the cup and I pressed the button. I went live on the internet and it went viral all over Britain. Welcome to another episode of Encounters with God. Our special guest today is John Edwards. And man, you're going you're to be thrilled to hear his testimony of the power of God and the witness of the Holy Spirit in his life. How truly... Um, just the providence of God, sovereignty of God, and just to witness some of the miracles that John has experienced and continues to experience in his own personal life and in, the, in his ministry. And uh, John's written a couple of books. We'll get to those. But uh, John, you're in Ireland today, correct? I'm in Ireland. I'm in County Tipperary in the south of Ireland as we speak. All right. Well, praise the Lord. Yes. It's a, it's a lovely fall day or autumn as we say it's lovely autumn day and um lovely and sunny here today yeah wonderful wonderful well uh, we'll just kind of get right to it john tell us tell us a little bit uh about your background about growing up uh the family you grew up in and and, and so forth uh well yeah um I, i'm from dublin ireland which is the capital of ireland um brought up in a catholic family uh, my dad was a, a successful businessman, so we didn't experience any poverty. However, um, it was a different, a difficult story in our house. I have four older sisters and two younger brothers, a good Catholic family. Yes, there and, you go. Uh, yeah, no television. Yes. And um, so uh, I was the first boy after four girls. And I was quite shy, very insecure, really, really shy. I mean, painfully shy. And when I was a kid, I was left-handed. And uh, in Ireland, if you're left-handed, back in the late 50s and 60s, there were superstitious connotations to it. And you were forced to write with your right hand. And they called you a kithog, which is a Gaelic name for um, a strange person. Yeah. And... Um, so uh, I was forced to write in my right hand and I, I was made to hold a black rubber ball in my left hand. So I had to do everything with my right hand. Some psychiatrists tell us that that can give you a stammer. And I ended up with a dreadful stutter. In school, I really struggled. But the teachers back then in Ireland, they used to try to force you to break the stutter. So they'd make me read in front of everybody. Now, that might not sound like a big deal to a lot of people listening, but for me as a very young kid, it was like, a, it, it was a horror. I, I absolutely hated school, hated it with every fiber of my being because yeah. the teacher had made me read. And when I go back home then again, it was the same. My father would make me answer the telephone. He'd make me answer the door trying to break my stutter. It's just the way, it, they didn't mean bad, but uh, the world has changed a lot since then. So that resulted in me feeling very uh, anxious. And... Um, Sometimes it, back then in the schools, they would they would hit you with, they had a, a bamboo cane, like a four foot long, and they'd whack you on the on, on your hands. You have to hold your hands out and they'd whack you on the hands. And um, I didn't mind that too much. I hated the reading in public and people sniggering and laughing at me. That used to crush me big time. Sure. And another thing I used to have was I used to blush at the slightest little thing, particularly when I got the age of 11 and 12. I blushed at every single thing. And again, that might not mean a lot, a lot to some people. But for me, in between these two ears, in my mind, it was, I felt I had the worst problem in the world with shyness. Mm -hmm. And that was my reality. So uh, that was the scene. By the time I reached the age of 12, 13, puberty began to kick in. I went to secondary school. I, I forget what you call secondary school in America, but we went yeah, to secondary junior school. High. Junior high, yeah. And um, so in there, people tried to bully me. I was never a very big guy. 
although believe it or not, when I was born, I was 11 pounds. Yeah. Uh, right. I don't know. I don't know what happened since then. I've only put on uh, about, uh, about 100 pounds since then. <laughs> yeah. And, um, so um, some people tried to bully me, but I was able to look after myself. I was I got a name as being a bit of a head case. So if people try to bully me, I would throw a rock at them, I'd pick up a big stick and I'd smack them on the back of the head or something. And I was terrified of fighting, but I, I learned early that if I if I terrify people, if people don't know what to expect from me, they'll stay away from me. Yeah. I learned to do that. And I got a I got a reputation of being a bit of a uh, a nutter is what we say in Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and uh, Scra- we call it so- a scrapper. <laughs> A scrapper, yeah. yeah. I, you know, when I'm little, I'm like a rat. You know, I jump up on your bike and I'll, I'll pummel you till you till you stop. <laughs> and um, at that time, uh, our family doctor prescribed my mother um, benzodiazepine, Valium. Hmm. I, I don't yeah. know if you call them that in America, Valium. Yeah, Valium. Uh, they're they're a very strong sleep, uh, very strong uh, tranquilizer. My father was had become an alcoholic by this stage. And uh, that cr- that created more horror in the house, and um, uh, so my mother took Valium, and it's amazing what kids notice in a house. I, I noticed they were helping my mother. Sure. And I remember thinking to myself, my parents have no idea how conscious I am of every single thing that's going on in this house. They think I'm just a kid, but I know I I could read situations and people, and I knew that Valium were helping my mother. So. Um, I, I decided I would try one of these volumes. Maybe it would help me with my anxiety. So when my mother wasn't looking, I took one out of the bottle in her handbag. And 20 minutes later, the effect of the pill came on. And Ken, it worked. The anxiety lifted quite a bit. I could speak a bit better without stuttering. And, um, and, uh, and by then, you see, I was beginning to fancy girls as well. And there's some girls hanging, da- hanging out with some guys down at the local community centre. And I knew the guys and girls down there were smoking blow, smoking cannabis, um, smoking grass, and uh, they were taking some drugs as well. I knew this, and that looked exciting to me. They were expressing themselves in a way that appealed to me. And uh, one of the girls down there, and she was a Protestant, and uh, Protestant Catholic in Ireland is a big deal. You could always tell the Protestants' houses in Dublin because they were painted nicer and the gardens were nicer because they had less children. <laughs> Yeah, that's that was, was a Protestant house. So uh, I took one of these volumes and it worked. The anxiety went. And then I discovered that if I had a drink of cider with that, and Ireland makes cider, and uh, if I had a drink of cider with it, I was even more courageous. So that girl, um, she became my girlfriend with the help of uh, Valium and dr- alcohol. Now, the reason I tell the story like that is... As a young teenager, we're meant to be, it's meant to be about developing character, developing self-esteem, developing the ability of communicating with the opposite sex and the same sex, you know, just communicating with people. But from that point in my life, I was 12 or 13, I used both alcohol and drugs to communicate, to deal with difficult situations. And I didn't build my self-esteem. I didn't build character. And uh, without alcohol, and, and, and pills, I was not very good at handling life very well. Uh, when I was 15 years of age, I, the teacher hit me uh, really, really hard. And the kids in the classroom, the other people in the classroom were laughing at me. And I just couldn't take anymore. So I stood up and I smacked the teacher in the jaw. And um, I got expelled for school, from school for that. I was, I was kicked out of school. I was only 15 years of age. And uh, my family had um, hairdressing and barber shops as well. And my father made me work in there. Mm. I hated it, but I loved meeting the people. And um, now I'm taking volume nearly every day. I learned... I, I learned through my new friends how to forge prescriptions. Back then, you could make prescriptions on paper before computers and mobile phones. Anyway, we forged prescriptions, and I was able to get these pills, Valium, over the counter. And unfortunately, I began to experience with other experiment with other uh, drugs as well. 
And before long, I was on the needle, injecting barbiturates straight into my veins. They're very strong sleeping pills. You, you, said, people, you, told your, you told yourself you'd never get on the needle too, didn't you? I told myself I would never use the needle. But addicts will do that. People who are experimenting with drugs, you have boundaries, you know, because yes. I had a, it, even though it was trouble at home, I had a half decent upbringing. I yeah. knew what was right. I knew what was wrong. And people do. That's why I get a real pain when people blame their mother or father or their blame a situation or circumstance that they're a drug addict because of this. No, I became a drug addict because I made a decision to take drugs. That's why I became a drug addict. And I, I moved on from one drug to another. But and one day, my friend Charlie, we were down in, in a, an Irish bar and um, he had a syringe with him and he had some palfium, which is an opiate. And he said, John, he said, I'm going upstairs to inject. Do you want to try some? So we ended up to the toilet in the in the bar. The bar was called the Sheds. I remember we went in, into the toilet and we sucked in water out of the cistern in the toilet. Not the actual bowl, but the cistern that holds the water. And we, we crushed up the pill and put it in. I injected half and Charlie injected half. And that was a high like I never had before. And that started me off in the needle. I, because you break boundaries. You want to get the high you had at the beginning. Valium weren't doing it anymore for me. So now I went on to other things. But I, by then, I was addicted to Valium. And um, when I tried to stop taking them, I would take convulsions. I would take fits. Mm-hmm. And um, back in Ireland in those days, uh, there was no detox centres. So they would put me into the local mental institution. And uh, I think there's one story I tell in the book of one mental home was in. They put me into a padded cell even and put me in a straitjacket and tied me up. And I had lots of unfortunate experiences in those places. I got into trouble in those places. And um, there was all kinds of sexual abuse and different things going on in there. And I tried to I tried to help some people in there and I got myself in trouble in different ways. And I was always terrified they'd keep me in the mental home. Mm-hmm. Ken, I wasn't, I wasn't crazy. I was just addicted. I was completely and absolutely dysfunctional. I could not live in that world out there without the help of some form of chemical, um, alcohol or drugs. And um, then my friends who had also become addicted, a group of about 30 of us, all the guys and girls from the community center, we all, the majority of us became addicted. Today, as I sit here, there's only seven of us alive out of 30. My friends began to die. My neighbors began to die, accidentally overdose. Some committed suicide because they couldn't handle the withdrawals. My friend Tom, who had a beautiful wife and baby, he killed himself. Uh, then HIV, AIDS came on the scene. And by then, the drug clinic had opened up in Dublin. And by then, I was taking sometimes 50 or 60 Valium a day. And um, so we'd go in and they'd meet us in the hazmat suits and the, and the masks over their face. And we were like the scum of the earth. And some of my friends had HIV, AIDS. I don't know how I didn't get it because we were sharing yeah, there was no needle exchanges. You, we'd have one syringe amongst 10 or 15 of us sometimes. And we wouldn't even clean it between people. We'd just pass it around. And sometimes it'd be so blunt, it would pop into your, it would pop into my arm and go straight through the vein. And we had abscesses in our arms and our legs. It was a complete and absolute mess. And our standards for hygiene, our standards for life itself just went out the window. And we never considered that we would die. It was always somebody else who would die. That's the mindset of an addict. You never think that you will. Yeah, it's going to happen to somebody else. It's going to happen to somebody else, yeah. And I'd never thought I would. Well, you had several instances where you OD'd, actually. I did, yeah. I, I've overdosed at least at least 20 times, Ken. I've been in comas for three and four days at a time. Uh, one particular day, I overdosed actually twice in one day. I overdosed. The ambulance brought me into the hospital in Dublin. They pumped my stomach. I walked out of the hospital, went straight back in drugs again, overdosed a second time, and I had my stomach pumped twice in one day. It's it's a miracle I'm still alive here. Yes, yes. Life went on, and um, as some of more... I, I remember one, one night in Dublin, we used to drink and take drugs on the seafront in Dublin Bay, and uh, there was a hedge, a hedging, 
and there was gaps in the hedge. And one day, one of my friend's fathers came in through the gap in the hedge, and there was probably 20 of us sitting, taking drugs and drinking, just sitting there. And he came over and he fell on his knees and he said, boys, I've just found my son. He was dead in his flat for three weeks. And he said, this sounds awful, but this is the reality. He said, rats were eating my son's body. He said, please, guys, please stop living the way you're living. He come down to tell us to try and change our life. We, the thing that shocked me is that I was getting used to people dying. And when he, he told us, I had no emotion whatsoever. I knew I had a responsibility to comfort him or to say something, but it was like a deadness on the, in, on the inside of me. And I remember that clearly. That kind of scared me a little bit. And I, I remember thinking, what is happening to me? Mm-hmm. Shortly after that, another friend died. He fell into the River Liffey or was pushed possibly in Dublin. And uh, I ran out of Ireland and I went to London. And I ended up, I had nowhere to live in London, so I very quickly ended up living on the streets. And then I had to beg for a living. I was begging on the streets of London. And the drug scene was in Piccadilly in London's West End. And uh, on the on the London Underground, the underground train, there was four subways, and Subway 4 was where all the drug dealing went on. And I began to run drugs to, so I could get drugs to feed my habit. And uh, a lot of overdoses in London. And... Um, I was in a terrible state. And that continued living like that, overdosing, living on the streets, sleeping in Soho, Charing Cross, Trafalgar Square, all these well-known places in London, staying in squats. We stayed in one squat up by Regent's Park where the Queen had her gardens. And there was 400 of us squatting. And it was like every day the ambulances were coming up and taking the dead out, taking the dead out who had overdosed. It, it was it was terrible. And... um the Salvation Army got a hold of me about that time. I don't think I mentioned this with Jay John. Uh, the Salvation Army got a hold of me one time and they took me into their house and they shared the gospel with me. And uh, But I never responded. Another day on the streets, I was down in a place called Wilsden, staying in, what they, in, in, staying in a, a homeless centre. And somebody else met me outside and they preached the gospel to me. And I actually went to a Christian meeting that night but I was—I had long hair. My teeth were caked out. I looked a complete mess. I was about—I um, was only about 85, 90 pounds in weight. I was a complete mess. And to somebody made an altar call for somebody to go forward for salvation. And I—I I actually walked forward, Ken. And I stood on the stage. And they left me standing there for 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes. I forget now, but it was long enough. I was mortified. I was so embarrassed. I thought even these Christians—they're—they're they're, they're, not—they're looking down on me. And I, they left me there. They dealt with everybody that left me because I was probably smelling and everything because I was on the streets. And I walked off the stage. I, it was in a tent. I walked at a diagonal across the tent, out the door. And I thought, even the Christians don't care. Yeah. Wow. And I went off into oblivion again. And I made several attempts to try and change my life. It didn't work. Yeah, one of the things that, that really struck me too was like when you were you were homeless and you were begging for money and you had your kind of your crew or your gang. And so oh, yeah. it was at night and y'all had a, a gentleman coming down the street. Yes. Y'all actually mugged this man. Y'all mugged him and you, you were the one who actually took his wallet and kind of tell us a little bit that story. Cause it kind of struck me that you, you had something of a conscience still it is far gone as you were is homeless uh you needed money you needed drugs and all that uh tell us what you did there well i was hanging out with a bunch of uh, scottish guys who had mohican haircuts and i I was showing my leadership potential i was like the gang leader and uh, we used to do things in the streets but this night uh, we were in uh, green park which is just in front of buckingham palace where the queen lives so you got Buckingham Palace, then you cross the road, you, you get a roundabout, then you have Green Park. And we were in there and it was twilight, it was getting late. And there was a man walking across the park and we decided to, he was an African man, and we decided that we'd mug him. 
And my head was in turmoil with this. I, I had not done that before. This was a step too far for me. Uh, because your upbringing stays, but there's a scripture that comes to my mind, or bring a child up in the ways of the Lord and he will return to it. And, mm-hmm. you know, the Catholic faith, even though I never experienced the presence of God, in it, it did put certain morals and standards and boundaries into me. And it had a bit of fear of God in me as well. But uh, we jumped on this guy in the park and we punched him. He went down. I took his wallet out of his pocket, but I made the mistake of looking in his eyes. And he was absolutely terrified looking. And I thought, what has become of me? How can I be doing this? So um, I looked at the guys and I, I gave the guy the wallet back. I said, guys, I said, back off. Leave this man alone. I gave him his wallet back. And I said, sir, I said, go home. I said, I'm sorry. I said, I wasn't brought up to do stuff like this. And I said, I don't know what's got into me. And um, he got up and I know Roger Bannister had beat the four minute mile, but this man must have, he must have cracked it. And I, he ran so fast across the park. And I felt so ashamed of myself. It was one of those marker moments in my life where I had become something that I could hardly identify. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really, uh, it was kind of a shift there with your conscience. And then I think another point that, uh, was your father's uh, funeral? Not long after that, I ended up living in an Irish place for the homeless. A lot of Irish uh, navvies, we call them, the road workers and work on building sites. And so I was in there and there was three of us in the room, uh, sharing a room, all alcoholic. And the phone rang out in the hallway. And um, it was never for me because I used to tell my family that I had a nice girlfriend, a nice apartment, I had a good job. My family weren't stupid. They knew I hadn't. But I, you know, anyway. So I didn't expect the phone to be from me, but it was. My family had traced me. And they found out that, um, uh, that my sister was on the phone and she told me, my sister Geraldine, and uh, who loves me, and they all love me. But um, they said, John, uh, daddy has just died. And... Um, he had a heart attack. I think it was the drink probably caused it. And he was only 64 years of age. But he said, John, we love you. The funeral is in a few days. But please, we've decided as a family that we don't want you to come home for the funeral because you're addicted and alcoholic. And if you come home, we're afraid you're going to cause mayhem at the funeral. And I understood it. I had, I had enough sense to understand that my life was out of control and I, I knew I had the capability of going to that funeral and getting stoned and drunk. I was out of control. And, uh, so uh, the morning my father was being buried, I had got some drugs and drink just to blank out the reality of that day. And um, I was down at back alley and um, I was with an older guy who was also homeless and we were drinking and taking pills together and the booze and drugs began to come on and my mind drifted back to St. Gabriel's Catholic Church in Dublin where my dad's funeral was. I knew exactly where my my mum and my brothers and sisters would be sitting and I knew exactly where my dad's coffin would be and I was thinking on it but the thing is um you don't let your emotions up. But I couldn't help but that morning. Tears came into my eyes. And the old homeless guy noticed. And he said, hey, I, my nickname on the streets was Irish. Hey, Irish, he said, uh, there's tears in your eyes. What's the matter with you? And I said, nothing. And I changed the subject and started talking about something else. Because you don't talk about your reality when you're living that kind of a lifestyle. But about 20 minutes later, thereabouts, my mind was back thinking about the funeral. And... Um, and but my dad not see my uh, dad always wanted to see me clean and sober, and now he never would. And I loved him, but I, I never told him or I never expressed it to him. I fought with him more than anything else. And I just couldn't help but the tears just shot out of my eyes and they ran down my face. And the old homeless guy said to me, Hey, Irish, he said, What's up? And I told him, I said, My father's been buried this morning back in Dublin in Ireland. And I said, my family don't want me to. I said, I'm, I'm so broken. And I fell apart. And the old guy just grabbed a hold of me and he pulled me towards him. And I buried my head in his left shoulder. And I just wept and he comforted me. People do that in the streets. When we're going through tough times, we sometimes look after each other. 
And he looked after me. He said, Irish, he said, you're a good lad. I can tell you've had a good upbringing. He says, for God's sake, go home. He said, if you don't go home, you're going to die in the streets. I know you've overdosed a lot. Go home, he said. And I, you know, I listened to him. I learned two things that day. The importance of sharing my reality and the importance of listening to other people's advice. And I went home a while afterwards. And my mother, uh, she took me in again. Typical, unconditional love that mothers have. That was a that was a touching that was a touching story there with your with your mom taking you back in. I kind of go through that story quickly. If I dwell too long on it, it's it is quite upsetting. Yeah, do you know I couldn't go to my dad's uh, graveside for ten years, oh. but I but I, I go now, and uh, I brought my wife down there, and and uh, I've shed I've shed tears. I've dealt with it. I put it behind, but it was just to to rem to to remember that to remember that day is still a little bit painful, Ken. Hmm. Well, tell us about when tell us about when you had your you had your really an encounter with the Holy Spirit when God really uh, yeah. came upon you, and then uh, shortly after that, I believe it was you you uh, you had tried a lot of rehab places. You were in and out of rehab or. Uh, psychiatric places, but I guess what was the turning point was when you went to a teen challenge for a year. Yeah. And well, and I went of... with Christian, I, I, I met some Christians in Alcoholics Anonymous and they told me about a meeting in Dublin. So I went to this Christian meeting and uh, they were playing some lovely music. I enjoyed the first one. So I went back to, I went back the next month to the same meeting. It was on once a month. And during that meeting, they were playing beautiful worship music. And I was listening to the words. The words were about God forgiving us, give us give, giving us a fresh start, you know, turning our lives around and uh, taking our shame and guilt away. And I had a lot of that. And privately in the meeting, I began to talk to God. I went down the back of the meeting, put my back against the wall, and I began to talk to God and said, God, if you're there, you must have seen me in the mental homes. If you're real, God, you must have seen me begging on the streets at my dead friends' funerals. When I was sexually abused where I can, not by family, outside family, but you must have seen me when I was abused. You must have seen all this, God. I said, God, if you're real, as these people are saying you are, please reveal yourself to me because I'm dying and I don't want to die. I said, please, God, if you're real, show yourself to me. When I spoke like that, not from my head, but from deep in here, I was calling out to God. Suddenly, it was like the roof came off the building. And the presence of God came in and it just hit me. Went shooting down through the inside of my head, down my chest. Something broke in my tummy. My neck felt like it swelled up and a long evil something came out that side of my head. Like, like it felt like it was coming out for ages. And my, I felt lighter when this happened. And my eyes got opened inside. And I knew that day that Jesus Christ was real. And I knew that when he died in Calvary 2,000 years ago, he died for me and he died for you and he died for everybody listening to this message. That night, Ken, my life changed forever. And shortly afterwards, I heard about Teen Challenge and I stopped smoking, drinking and taking drugs before, just before I went into Teen Challenge. And I went in and God set me completely free. And that was 30, almost 34 years ago now. Mm, praise God. What was it that was so different about Teen Challenge compared to the other places that you had been in? It had the presence of God in it. And uh, as far as I was concerned, I was more ready. I was really broken. I couldn't take any more. There was no more recoveries left in me. But I was when I was a bit younger and I tried rehabs and that, I probably gave it 70% effort. But this, I was completing this rehabilitation. Uh, uh, a team of wild horses would not have taken me out of Teen Challenge. I was completing this if it killed me. And I completed it, graduated. And then when I finished, I went back to London where I used to be homeless. And I lived on the streets on purpose. I lived with the drug dealers, with the addicts. I used to sleep in the doorways. And they gave me a new nickname. They called me the Apostle John, the Irish Apostle. And I led hundreds of people to Christ on the streets and... And my life went on from there and um, I began to grow more in confidence. I began to speak in different churches. Then I wanted to reach more people, but I had no money. And uh, But I had two strong legs. So I walked the length and breadth of Ireland 
nearly 600 miles, preaching the gospel every day, going on radio. Then I walked length and breadth of Wales, praying for revival, going through all the areas where the revival was in 1904 in Wales. Then I walked from the top of Scotland to the bottom of England, nearly a thousand miles. Then I thought, this is great. So then I decided, and I, I walked and cycled from Santa Monica in Los Angeles all the way across the USA to Ground Zero, and then I touched the Atlantic Ocean just at New York there. And uh, so I called my ministry Walking Free for obvious reasons. Yes, very appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's interesting how you went at, when you got out of Teen Challenge. I mean, it's one of the things that really hit me was the passion you had to win the lost. I mean, you 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 could have done several things, but you were back on the streets. But this time you weren't back putting a needle in your arm. You were back showing them the love, the power, the uh, salvation of Jesus Christ and what God had Amen. done in your life. And I mean, you, you slept on the streets with them. You I were did, yeah. not just feeding them and clothing them. You were, I mean, no. you were right there with them. You, it was cold and you're spending the night out there on the streets yeah. with them. I had my piece of cardboard on the ground. I, that was my mattress. I lived in, I lived in the doorways with them. And sometimes we'd have 10, 15 people in the doorway and I'd be praying for them and teaching them from the scriptures, getting them into rehabilitation centers. And then I don't know if I mentioned this, but I've opened several rehabilitation centers. After I finished walking, I opened Scotland's first women's center. I opened up two men's centers and that was successful. But when I walked across America, when I walked and cycled across America, I got sick, Ken. And I came home and I got examined and I had three cancerous tumors on my liver from hepatitis C, from dirty needles. So I got a liver transplant a few weeks. I only was waiting four and a half weeks and I got a new liver. Wow. So I sometimes joke and say, I've been delivered. You have, yes, so, in, so, in, uh, in several ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've got a Scottish liver, but the rest of me is Irish. And um, so that liver transplant was 17 years ago. It was very successful. I'm very fit. I actually became the Irish transplant champion in the 1500 meters, 800 meters and 400 meters. The rest of my body was super fit. It's just my liver was in bad, bad condition. Mm -hmm. So that was 17 years ago. And um, I've retired from running rehabilitation centers. I'm still writing books. I'm writing two books at the moment. And um, uh, I work as an evangelist. We have a team of evangelists in Ireland. I travel around the world preaching the gospel. And... Um, I've, I've, I've had the hepatitis C treatment, so the hepatitis C is gone now. I'm completely, I'm 68 years of age now, completely fit, and uh, still work out, still walk and run a little bit. And, uh, and then when I, um, when I um, went to run the rehabs in Scotland, I, I felt a bit lonely at that time in my life, and I prayed to God for a wife. And one day I was driving through a little Scottish town called Largs, where the Vikings were defeated in 1262. A little bit of history for you. Yeah. And I was driving through the town and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, stop your car, call into the little Nazarene church in the corner. There's somebody for you to meet. And cut a long story short, I went in and uh, this lady served me a cup of coffee and uh, she was my future wife. I'd actually written down 22 things I was looking for in the woman I'd marry. And um, so Tricia, she's half Scottish and half Irish. She had four children. So I was single for 42 years. Then overnight, there were six of us. So that was quite traumatic as well, having four kids overnight. But now I've got four grandchildren, which is a, the biggest blessing of my life, having family. Yeah, well, I think that's so, that's so neat, just that story, because, you know, it, it just shows that God that God still speaks today. You know, you're driving down the road, you've got your game plan, you're headed from point A to point B, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit speaks to you and says, turn that car around, John. I got something <laughs> for you. Yeah. yeah. And you were obedient. And, you know, I wasn't even 100% sure it was God. It was a really strong impression on my heart. I thought, wow, well, I think God's speaking to me. So I just thought, I'll give it a shot. I'll try it and see. It was a Saturday morning. I didn't even know if the church door would be open. And it was, there was a coffee morning on. And my wife served me first cup of tea. She's been serving me cups of tea since then. Yeah, praise God. Well, sometimes that's what it is. It's just a, a real strong impression. I, I, exactly. I think we can ignore those 
or we can follow through and, uh, yeah. you know, thank God you follow through. I've had situations like that before. Where I thought this is just crazy. You know, here I am, I'm, I'm pumping some gas at a gas pump. And I felt like the Holy spirit was, I just had this impression was there's a woman on the other side of the pump. You know, the pump is between us. She's on the other side. And I felt like the Lord, the Lord was just saying, give that woman a hundred dollars. So at first I thought, no, I'm not going to do it. And then as I sat there and argued back and forth, it, I couldn't, I couldn't get rid of it. So I, I pulled my billfold out, reached out, pulled a hundred dollar bill out. And I stuck, stuck it right through there and handed it to her. She broke down crying. Wow. She said, sir, she said, I just lost my job. And I was wondering how I was going to keep my electricity on. Wow. And, and you know, there, it's just the spirit, of, you know, the spirit of God. It was just an impression that you couldn't let go of. So, you know, it's a, it's what we're supposed to, to be doing. You know, God's supposed to be yes, speaking and leading and guiding us on these things. I mean, I'm in, I'm in Ireland now. God spoke to me a few months ago, go back and live in Ireland because I was living in the UK. Mm -hmm. and God spoke yeah. to me, go home, go home to Ireland and start reaching out all over Ireland again. So most people my age are retiring. I'm starting up a whole new chapter. Yes. Yes. Well, you've done some, some, uh, you know, just like the old Testament prophets, God told them sometimes to do some things that were just kind of bizarre. And I know a couple of things is, uh, the Lord spoke to you and told you to build a syringe, like a needle yes, that you did. used to inject into your body. Yes. Um, so I built it. It's the biggest syringe in the world. It's uh, 33 feet long. It's 33 feet long and six foot in diameter. And um, it's got a bedroom in the front of it. And um, so I would drive the big syringe behind my truck into a town or a village or a city and I park it up and you see this giant syringe coming in there. Everybody comes over. So I have, and you can get into it. There's a little ladder under it. You can climb up into it. So I've got a chair. And in the winter, you're out of the rain. You're out of the cold. I have a heater in there. So people come in and I pray with them. And uh, we have had uh, tremendous times just praying, praying with um, addicts, praying with drug dealers, praying with single mothers, uh, all kinds of incredible situations that we've had with that. And then after I did that, I, I, I built um, a prison cell. Yes. So I have a prison cell over here in Ireland. So I drive around. So during lockdown, I was driving around with my prison cell. And uh, here's a picture. Here's a picture of the, that's the prison cell there. Prison cell, yes. And um, I'm trying to find one of the syringe here for you. But I, I, when we're doing that, I go into a neighborhood and I just park up these things. And my team, many of my team, not all of them, but a good few of my team are recovered gangsters, drug addicts, drug dealers, uh, male and female, and they're completely free today. So we we just go on the streets and we share our testimonies. One church that we that we set up recently, over the last few months, they've led over eight hundred people to Christ. Praise God! Using these tools because they're just they're radical tools, and people come over to us and they. I can't find a picture of the syringe. I'm sorry, Kent. So yeah, that that syringe just really draws attention. It's not like somebody going out there with a big Bible and uh, preaching the gospel to them. That's great and wonderful, but that's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, it's a shock to their eyes. And in our culture today, it seems like people need to, you know, to be shocked, to be, you know, what wake up, you know, here's something. Look at this, you know, exactly. here's here's a sign. One of the difficulties street evangelists have is people walking past and they don't like to be interrupted. But if you have something that drag their attention, yes, they will come over to you. So I use lots of things. I have a coffin, a coffin that is on straps. It goes on my back. I, I've carried a big cross. I carried a cross across America, an 11 foot long cross. Um, so we have the cross and the coffin and the coffin has a door in it. So everybody, what are you doing with the coffin? people stop sometimes i can't walk down the street because that many people stop me and i say well you want look open the door see what's in the coffin so they open it up and the door is about that size they open look in and have a mirror in it 
And I go, oh my God, I can see myself in the coffin. And it freaks people out a little bit. And say, well, yeah. I say, one day you're going to be in one of them. But before you go into the coffin, you need to meet the cross. You need to meet Christ. Let me talk to you just for a minute. But the reality is because that startled you. That's giving you a shock. Let's yeah. talk about life and death and where you're going after it. So, uh, the, and the syringe, injecting hope into society instead of injecting dope into society. Love it. And the, the prison cell, and uh, for obvious reasons, it just talks about freedom. So we preach the gospel from inside the prison cell. And then I kick the door open. And I say, my prison cell is open. It's yours. You're in a prison of sin. And um, But then, do you want me to tell you about the other coffin? Yeah, I, I definitely want to talk about you. You, you had, yeah, I think you were preaching a funeral, was it? And uh, God kind of yeah. started speaking to you about burying yourself. I mean, you're 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 yeah. six foot under, so yeah, let's share yeah. that. I, I I've had to bury a number of people, and this young guy, I had led him to Christ. He he overdosed and died, and I, while I was burying him, his wife and children were there, and his mother and father, and they were all crying. And I thought, if you could speak from the coffin, what would you say to your kids now? What would you say to your wife? Or what would you say to your mother and father? Would you apologize? What would you say to them? And I felt the Holy Ghost saying, you do it, John. Do what, Lord? Again, this is God speaking to me. You make a coffin and you live in a six foot underground and you broadcast live stream from the coffin. So I made a coffin eight foot long. That um, it was about um, it was a meter high and a meter wide. And I buried it in a place called Halifax in Yorkshire in England, six foot underground. And I went down. It had a mattress, had electricity, and I had fiber optic broadband in my coffin. So, <laughs> so it had two tubes going to the surface for airflow, and so they could pass food down. Um, and I, I saw so I went down in the coffin. I pressed the button. I went live on the internet, and it went viral all over Britain. It went on television, BBC, ITV, all the big stations in the UK, Scotland, England, Wales and Ireland, and even into Europe and other places. I reached 28 million people and they heard the full gospel, the full gospel, my full testimony. And it was interactive, so people were phoning in. We had 15 live suicides phoning in. We were to pray for every single one of them. It was miraculous what happened. So I thought, this is great. I'm going to do it again. Then somebody heard about me in the States and they asked me to do it in Florida. So I did it in, I did it in Tampa, Florida. Then I did it in Winter Haven, Florida. Then drug cartels threatened to smoke bomb me down there. And then I did it in Baltimore, um, Maryland, outside the world's biggest drug clinic. And uh, that was crazy. But we were reaching, it was going viral on TV. It went live in Colombia to television, Argentina, Nicaragua, Brazil, uh, then it went to Australia, India, Africa, Indonesia, all the European countries, Russia, so much so in Russia, I had to get my book translated into Russian, and it's circulated in the prisons over there now, so I got buried six times in all, I got buried in Belfast, somebody threatened to shoot me in Belfast because I was a Catholic buried in a Protestant neighborhood, and uh, they thought I was an answer to their prayers, I buried yeah. Catholic. So uh, they threatened to shoot me. But then some people come out and they defended me. So nobody touched me. But um, we reached so many people. Uh, other people have estimated for me. They said it was over 100 million people that we reached. Hmm. Yeah, That's why I use these crazy gimmicks. You know, Ken, when I became a Christian first, I was really touched. By, and I knew from the word go I'd be an evangelist. But I met a lot of Christians and they tried to make me like them. You know, lovely people, lovely, lovely people, admirable people. But I've lived a different life. I've always lived on the edge. I've always expressed myself in radical ways. And I, I, I realized I don't want to lose that. I want to keep the radical. I used to get a lot of negative attention in the past. Why can't I flip that and get a lot of attention and point people to Jesus Christ? So I do these radical outreaches with the coffin. And I get some criticism for it. But. Then again, I, I always got criticism when I was an addict, so I'm kind of used to that as well. But a lot of people who gave me criticism for the coffin, and I got a lot of criticism for the coffin. In fairness to the people who criticized me, most of them came back and apologized to me. And they said, that is one of the most powerful outreaches we've ever seen in our lifetimes. Yeah, look at the results. 
Oh, it Look was. At, I mean, oh, it, you know, show me the fruit. Show me the yeah. fruit. Yeah. I was getting twenty calls a minute at one stage. It was all well. I couldn't. I couldn't answer all the calls. Mm. And when you were wasn't... underground, um, h- how did you feel? Did you sense? Uh, you knew God was using that in a special way. It was so unusual. You I mean you're buried six foot underground? When I get into the coffin, first of all, you have to fight. I'm I'm quite strong. My mind is strong, so I'm able to fight off claustrophobia and stuff like that. Um, but um, uh, the greatest fear I had is that, particularly the first time, and also the first time in America, I thought if this doesn't work, I'm going to look like a proper idiot. Okay, if nobody phones in and it's just an Irish man six foot underground, and nobody pin any attention. And that was my biggest fear. And in Florida, the first time I got buried there, um, I was I, I was getting some traffic. You know, there were a good few people listening, but not as many as I wanted. And then Fox News phoned me. And Fox News came down. And the news anchor from Orlando came down to interview me. And um, she's talking down the tube where I'm six foot underground. Mm. And she asked me, what in God's name are you doing down in that coffin? And I told her. And she began to cry. I said, why are you crying? She said, I'm a recovering addict myself and nobody knows. Wow. And I went, wow. And she was one of these beautiful um, American newscasters, you know, and I thought, wow. And she said, listen, John, we're going to go live now. So I could hear her going live upstairs. The cameras and all for Fox News are up there. And she said, she said, my, my name is Jen Epstein. She said, she said, um, I've got a man under my feet here. His name is John Edwards. And, I want to tell you something today. I'm going to introduce myself to you like I've never introduced myself to you before. She said, my name is Jen, and I'm a recovering alcoholic. Bam, it went viral. And she said, she began to cry, and it went viral. And then she interviewed me, and the New York phoned up, Los Angeles, and different places around the States phoned up. And it was really quite radical. Yes, that's powerful. In Baltimore, I had a, mud, I had a mudslide. I was going to say that, you know, yeah, uh, yeah there's terrain, tr- terrain. Tr- some things could happen, you know, buried six foot under. Yeah. How do you get out yeah, of the mud slide? And all the muck turned, it turned into mud and it was coming in through, it was coming in through the, the gaps in the coffin. It was going down my neck and in my head. And I had, I, I had different things trying to, so it was a bit of an emergency with the team. They all had to get upstairs and take a lot of the mud off and, and put a uh, plastic paper over and stuff like that. So, but I stayed there. I I I I completed the three days. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you certainly got a passion for the lost and reaching the lost, and uh, you know, you folks, John is certainly a, a doer of the word, not just a hearer only. Amen. So, um, yeah. So what's uh what's the condition of the church in Ireland? The traditional church there is the church. Uh, have they gone, I guess you'd say, have they gone woke? Are they, uh, uh, you well, know, what's the spiritual temperature of, uh, I know there's Catholic, Protestant, but maybe. Well, the traditional church in Ireland would be Catholic and Protestant. In the Republic of Ireland, which is the south of Ireland, it's uh, mostly Catholic. But there's a lot of abuse issues uh, were uncovered and the whole country. They went all over the countries on television. And there was a real shift from Catholic. It was a very Catholic country. There's very few people in Catholic churches now. It's completely changed. And um, then um, when I got when I became a Christian, there were probably only about five thousand born again Christians in the Republic of Ireland who were attending church. We had a charismatic revival in the in the uh, in the eighties. And, but the Catholic Church closed that down. But a lot of people got born again in it and they were had retreated because the Catholic Church pushed them back. But a lot of those people are born again around Ireland. But um, uh, then Ireland began to change. And I went to live in Scotland to run rehabs in 1996. And then people began to come into Ireland from different countries, from Africa, from Poland, from Russia, from all these, Kazakhstan, from all these different countries. India. So now Ireland has completely changed. So a lot of these people that came in from Africa, they were Christians. 
Polish Christians from all the different nations. Romain, the biggest church in Dublin now is Romanian. Hmm. So they've all come into this country. So they've been a blessing bringing the gospel into the country. But um, a lot of the churches, like Assemblies of God, my pastor initially was from uh, Oklahoma. Oh, no, from, he was from Oklahoma, from Broken Bow in Oklahoma. He was the Assemblies of God missionary. So a lot of missionaries when I got saved. Now Irish people have raised up through the, a lot of help of American missionaries in the beginning. A lot of Irish people like myself have raised up now. We're planting churches all over the country. So there's a new move beginning to happen. And I've come over here specifically to be to pull my team together to help train the churches that we really would take on this and hit every single county in Ireland with the gospel, Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. We're going to hit every single county in the country. We're, we've already done every county, but we do them, we're going to do them again and again and again and again and again until, and I'll do some other crazy ideas that every man, woman and child in Ireland will hear the gospel through media or through some crazy way that I'll think of. Mm. And you, you also, in your kind of the follow-up book, I guess, you had a, a an experience of heaven. Let me share a yes, little bit about that. Yes, I did. Um, I don't talk about it very often. It was more of a personal experience, but I went through, I went, the church I was in split, Ken, and it was one of the most painful times of my life. I was really broken. Some people came against me, Christians, and they treated me like the scum of the earth. And sometimes that happens in Christianity. That doesn't mean all Christians are bad. God's a loving God. And most of my friends are are, are incredible Christian people. But sometimes these things happen in church. And, uh, but we're bigger than that, aren't we? We're bigger than that. We press through those things. But I was very broken. I was very broken. My attitude is always press. I'll navigate it some way. I'll get through it. I don't react and go back. I'm not going to be a victim of nobody. So I pushed on through it. And uh, But I was so broken, so incredibly broken. It nearly destroyed our marriage and everything. Uh, I probably couldn't take much more of it. And that scripture came to mind that no test has seized us except what's common to man. But God is faithful to provide a way out for it. So one night, I, I got a phone call uh, from these people in Scotland whose daughter I had helped. And she was leaving rehab and she was demanding her pills. And they asked me to pray for her. But I didn't feel like praying for anybody. I was barely surviving myself. I was thinking about giving up the ministry as well. I was so broken. Anyway. Cut a long story short, I prayed for that girl. And I realized as I prayed for her, it took the attention of myself. I was quite justified in being broken and being in a lot of pain. But nevertheless, that kind of pain is still self-centered. And I began to realize my pain is self-centered. And I went to bed that night. And after praying for the girl, my wife, Tricia, and I prayed for the girl. And uh, Tricia went to bed first, and I did a few things, and I went into bed. And as I put my head on the pillow, bang, I got lifted out of here. And I was instantly in this big room that I knew was the waiting room in heaven. I can't tell the whole story. It would take too long. But then uh, my name was called. And I knew my life was being examined in heaven to see if my name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I was absolutely terrified. My knees were knocking with fear. fear. I was thinking, am I saved? Yes, I am. I believe in the blood of Jesus. I believe the resurrection, I believe Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I confess that he is. I'm saved. Then somebody called my name from the front of the room. John Charles Edwards, come forward. And there was like a screen on the wall, and it went forward. And my head was down with shame. I couldn't look at this face. The face was blurred. And the scripture came to me, no man can see the face of God and live. And the man said to me, John Charles Joseph Edwards, your life has been examined. You are spotless because of the blood of the Lamb. Enter into rest. And the revelation I got of justification by faith was completely mind-blowing. And then a man came out from the far side. And I looked up and he was dressed like in, like in a colonel's military uniform with medals of victory, of battles fought and victories won. And he walked around behind me and he came and he stood in front of me to my left. And he said, John Charles Joseph Edwards, you've suffered much pain, haven't you? I said, yes, I have. 
you've suffered much grief. He said three, three things. I said, yes, I have. He said, this will never happen to you again. Come with me. And he took me by my left elbow and he turned me and we walked towards the far wall. On the third or fourth step, we entered out of that room into the lower parts of heaven. And I was there and quickly a young angel came down to meet me. And this, I was completely overwhelmed with the glory of God. That's how I know it was heaven. It was, it was black and it was like stars. There was no sense of wake, weight. But none of that really mattered. The presence of God was what was called. Pre- heaven is the presence of God. This young Granger came down and said, John, Charles, Edward. They kept using my full name. We've got something to show you. And they flew me up into higher heaven. And the presence of God got so strong that I remember thinking to myself, my body is going to die. Like the Apostle Paul, he said, I know a man, was in it, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. I don't know what was in my body, out of my, but I felt like my body was going to die. The, this body is not built to carry that glory. The presence of, of, of God was so powerful. Then they stopped and they opened up, the side of heaven opened up and I could see earth. And I could see people falling into hell. And uh, I won't get into all the details. I could see people falling into hell. And I began to weep. And the young angel flew down onto earth and it began to move things around a bit. There were straight and narrow roads and the hell they were fought and, and the hell they were going to fall into vanished. And um, heaven appeared at the end and crosses came out of heaven and landed on earth. There were divine appointments happening. And as all these crosses were coming out of heaven, landing all over the earth and people were getting, thousands of people were getting saved everywhere. Then I heard the voice of God, John Charles Edwards, the voice of the father. It was further up in heaven. John Charles Edwards, take the gospel to the lost and take the cross to my people. John Charles Edwards, take the gospel to the lost. And I woke up in my bed. And three hours had passed. And it felt like two minutes. But it was three hours had passed. And I was changed. I was healed. I was called by God back into the ministry. And nothing could have stopped me remaining evangelist as an evangelist from that moment. The next morning, I got a phone call. And the girl who was going to leave the rehab, she had a miracle that night and she got delivered and set free completely. And she ended up pastoring a church with her husband a couple of years later. Yeah, praise God. That was a life-changing experience. The presence of God. Heaven is so real, Ken. I can tell you, it's more, it's more real than this wall I'm knocking on here. It's more real. It's more, it's more intimate. It's more the detail in heaven. The, the presence, it's, there, there's a reality that's more real than this reality we live in. And I know I'm going back there again. That's why, I mean, I haven't had a liver transplant. Had 41 points of my blood transfused over the last few years. Cancer in my head again. I've survived every single thing. I'm as fit as a fiddle. I believe it's because I'm living for the purposes of God. And nobody can kill me until it's time for me to go home to be with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Folks, if y'all want to hear more of that story, you can get John's. Uh, we'll put it in the show notes. But John's book is called, his follow-up book is called For Heaven's Sake. And his uh, first book here is uh, Walking Free, uh, Walking Testimony of the Miracle of God. So, so John, uh, uh, how can uh, the viewers, if they wanted to reach out to you, do you have like a website or social media? How, how could they get in contact with you if they wanted to help support your ministry or that sort of thing? Absolutely. That would be a blessing because we live by faith. The website address is www.walkingfree.org. And there's a place we can get pounds, euro or dollars on there. People can see that. RM. If people just wanted to hear some of my messages where I talk about freedom, they can listen to my live streaming on John Edwards Walking Free on YouTube or Facebook Live. You might not be aware, Ken, but I've just started off a recovery radio station, which is on a web, it's on a website at the moment. We will have an app. It's just launched. It's just brand new. So there's a lot of content still waiting to go on it. It's recoveryradiointernational.com. Recovery Red, that's brand new. So there's only 14 testimonies in it now. But when I'm in the States in October, we're going to interview people in America, American testimonies on. We're going to hit the streets in different places and get lots of testimonies from all over the world. And it'll be a real blessing to people. It'll be talking their language of the language of the addicts. It'll be interviews at rehabs in America and over here in Europe as well. 
and it's going to be a great big blessing, the, a voice of hope into the world, the fourth world of addiction. That's what I call it, the fourth world of addiction. Hmm. Praise God. Well, just leave us with a little 30-second, one, one minute invitation to, to the Lord uh, for people out there that are struggling or that may be addicted or to alcohol uh -huh. or drugs. And uh, we'll just close out with that, give you the final word here. Well, if you're watching here tonight or listening in here tonight, and uh, you've maybe it's the first time you heard a story like me, mine, uh, maybe you're broken, you've got a situation or circumstance in your life, and you know, if you're falling apart, and you might even be suicidal listening to this broadcast. And, uh, um, you know, Jesus Christ is real. He died at Calvary 2,000 years ago. He shed his blood for the forgiveness of your sin. He took your guilt. He took your shame. He took your brokenness. And, you know, maybe you're really at the end of yourself and you've been privately calling out to God. Well, I want you to know today that I'm going to give you an opportunity to invite Jesus Christ into your heart to be your personal Lord and Savior. I'm going to pray a prayer now, and I pray that you will pray this with me. And you will pray it with all of your might, like it's the most important prayer you've ever prayed. And I promise you, God will reveal himself to you. He's real. He will show himself to you. He'll reveal himself to you in a personal way just for you. If you'd like to pray that prayer, please pray out loud wherever you are. You know, you can get on your knees or sit down, whatever you want to do. Just pray this prayer out loud. Just pray like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died and shed your blood for the forgiveness of my sin. Please forgive me, Jesus. Please come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. I renounce Satan and all darkness. I receive you by faith today, Jesus. And I declare out loud that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. To the glory of God. If you prayed that prayer today, please let Ken know. Or let us know that you've prayed that prayer. And find a local church. Get yourself a Bible. Begin to read the scriptures. And I want you to know that we love you. We'll be praying for you over here in Ireland. I'll be praying specifically that people who watch this broadcast will truly invite Christ and that you'll have an experience and that you'll be set free from all the things that bind you and you get a smile back in your heart again where it really matters and get a skip back in your step. God bless you all. And Ken, thank you so much for the great privilege of sharing with you here today.